O Lord God, our merciful Father, we come before you in awe and wonder as we consider the amazing love that you have shown to rebellious humankind in the suffering and death that your Son so patiently endured. Lord, fill us with an ever greater appreciation for the sacrifice that you made for us. All the worship and praise that we can give cannot thank you enough for what you have done for us. Accept our praise today and increase our faith and love for you. Hear us for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. We begin with our opening hymn, hymn 723. <laughs> sins in the presence of God and of one another. Holy and gracious God, I confess that I have sinned against you this day. Some of my sin I know, the thoughts and words and deeds of which I am ashamed, but some is known only to you. In the name of Jesus Christ, I ask forgiveness. Deliver and restore me that I may rest in by the mercy of God, we are redeemed in Christ Jesus, and in him we are forgiven. We rest now in his peace and rise in the morning to serve him. Amen. We respond. By awesome deeds, you, are, you answer us with righteousness, O God of our salvation. 
the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas. We, we have, have this as a sure and, and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place behind the curtain, where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf. And the Lord said to Moses, Tell Aaron your brother not to come at any time into the holy place inside the veil. We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all the work that he had done. For if Joshua had given them rest, God would not have spoken of another day later on, so that there remains a Sabbath rest for the people of God. The whole bull he shall carry outside the camp to a clean place, to the ash heap, and shall burn it upon a fire of wood. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. On the morning of the third day, there were thunders and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain and a very loud trumpet blast, so that all the people in the camp trembled. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkle of blood that speaks a better word than the blood of Abel. You may be seated for the reading of our Passion History. We'll be reading from Lesson 5, which you can find on page 14 in your Passion History folder. Pilate called together the chief priests, the rulers, and the people, and said to them, You brought this man to me as one who is misleading the people. Look, I have examined him in your presence. I have found in this man no basis for the charges you are bringing against him. Herod did not either, for he sent him back to us. See, he has done nothing worthy of death, so I will have him flogged and release him. At the time of the festival, the governor had a custom to release to the crowd any one prisoner they wanted. At that time, they were holding a notorious prisoner named Barabbas, who had been thrown in prison for a rebellion in the city and for murder. The crowd came up and began to ask Pilate to do for them what he usually did. So when they were assembled, Pilate said to them, Do you want me to release the king of the Jews to you? Which one do you want me to release to you? Barabbas? Or Jesus, who is called Christ. For Pilate, in fact, knew that he had that they had handed Jesus over to him because of envy. While he was sitting on the judgment seat, Pilate's wife sent him a message. Have nothing to do with that righteous man, she said, since I have suffered many things today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus put to death. The governor asked them, which of these two do you want me to release to you? They all shouted together with one voice, Take him away! Release Barabbas to us! Pilate said to them, Then what do you want me to do with the man you call the king of the Jews? What should I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said to him, Crucify him! But the governor said, Why? What has he done wrong? But they kept shouting even louder, Crucify him! Pilate addressed them again, because he wanted to release Jesus. But they kept shouting, Crucify! Crucify him! He said to them the third time, Why? What evil has he done? I have found no grounds for sentencing him to death, so I will whip him and release him. But they kept pressuring him with loud voices, demanding that he be crucified, and their voices were overwhelming. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. We'll pause there to sing in response to hymn 724.
governor's soldiers took Jesus into the praetorium and gathered the whole cohort of soldiers around him. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him. They twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand, knelt in front of him, and mocked him by saying, Hail, King of the Jews! They spit on him, took the staff, and hit him repeatedly on his head. They also kept hitting him in the face. Pilate went outside again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and guards saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! Pilate told them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. Crucify him. For I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He went back inside the palace again and asked Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate asked him, Are you not talking to me? Don't you know that I have the authority to release you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no authority over me at all if it, had not been, if it had not been given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release Jesus, but the Jews shouted, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside. He sat down on the judge's seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, or Gabbatha in Aramaic. It was about the sixth hour on the preparation day for the Passover. Pilate said to the Jews, Here is your king. They shouted, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Should I crucify your king? We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. When Pilate saw that he was accomplishing nothing, and that instead it was turning into a riot, he decided that what they demanded would be done. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd, and said, I am innocent of this righteous man's blood. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, Let his blood be on us and on our children. Since he wanted to satisfy the crowd, Pilate released Barabbas to them. So then Pilate handed Jesus over to them to be crucified. After they had mocked him, the soldiers took off the robe and put his own clothes back on him. Then they led him away to crucify him. Jesus was carrying his own cross. As they were going out of the city, a certain man, Simon of Cyrene, the father of Alexander and Rufus, was passing by on his way from the country. They placed the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large crowd of the people was following him, including women who were mourning and wailing for him. Jesus turned to them and said, Daughters of Jerusalem, stop weeping for me, but weep for yourselves and for your children. Be sure of this, the days are coming when they will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never gave birth, and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will begin to say to the mountains, Fall on us, and to the hills, cover us. For if they do these things to the green wood, what will happen? the dry. Here ends our Passion History reading. We continue with the next hymn, hymn 722.
us pray. Lord, I believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Amen. Text for our meditation this evening comes from Hebrews chapter 13. We read verses 11 through 13. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the holy places by the high priest as a sacrifice for sin are burned outside the camp. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach he endured. Dear friends in Christ, Mary Mallon was born in Ireland in 1869. At the age of 15, she emigrated to America, and when she got to New York City, she became a household cook for a number of different households. And that was where problems started popping up. Wherever she cooked, the people who would eat her food would become violently ill, and in several cases, they died. No one could really explain it. And so she would get evicted from these houses, and she would get an alias, and she would get a job at a different household. But everywhere she went, people started turning up sick. She ended up cooking for eight different houses in New York, seven of them, which became violently ill. And she got a new name, Typhoid Mary. Perhaps you've heard of that before. Her story is a very sad one. She was an asymptomatic carrier of the typhoid fever, which means that while she didn't have any symptoms of typhoid herself, she was carrying the disease in her pancreas, and anyone she came in contact with would get sick with typhoid fever. She ended up infecting some 50 people before they took some drastic measures. The only way they could stop her from spreading this disease was by quarantining her. And there she was, separated from the rest of civilization for the final 30 years of her life, never coming into contact with a person again. This was the only way to keep people from dying from this disease that she was carrying. It's hard to imagine that. 30 years separated from any other person because of a disease that you happen to carry. Could you endure that? Could I? Probably not. Rather, I think in those circumstances, we'd probably lose hope. We'd probably cry out against the Lord. Well, we might have a hard time taking such rejection and shame, but we see tonight that Jesus Christ, our Savior, also endured similar circumstances and for a similar reason, as we'll see. So I invite you this evening to keep your eyes focused on Jesus. He is our endurance. May the Lord bless our study this evening. Now our lesson actually begins many, many centuries before Jesus came on the scene, during the days of Moses. In those days, when an anointed priest would sin or when the people of Israel would sin, they had a custom which would take place. They would take a young bull without defect, bring it to the priest, and the priest would lay his hands on the head of the bull and confess the sins of the people. This would symbolize the transferring of the sins from the people to the bull. After this was done, then the bull would be slaughtered. Its blood sprinkled on the altar, its fat offered there on the altar to the Lord. And then the priest would take the entire bull He'd carry it outside of the camp, and there he would burn it, burning up the sins of the people. That's recorded in Leviticus chapter 4, verse 12. All the rest of the bull he shall carry outside the camp. He shall burn it upon a fire of wood. On the ash heap it shall be burned up. If you remember back a few years ago during the Ebola crisis, that Ebola, a deadly virus that is incurable, or mostly incurable, and easily comes into contact with people and infects them. Ebola, the only way to treat it is to burn the people who are infected with it, after they died, of course. The Center for Disease Control 
announced that anyone who died from Ebola had to be cremated. You couldn't touch the body, couldn't move it, couldn't have a funeral. Cremate the body first and then go about with the funeral. Because only through burning the Ebola virus could it actually be taken care of. Now this is the proper way to think about sin. And this is exactly how the animal was treated, as if it had this deadly Ebola virus. It was carrying the disease of the sins of the people, and it was removed from the community, taken away. You might even say that this animal was quarantined as it was led outside the camp, quarantined because of the evil that had been placed upon it. And that's how we ought to think about sin. A deadly disease, one that infects us all and one that we need to keep as far away from us as we can. One that we should even burn up if necessary. Now this bull, it endured its final suffering outside of the camp, away from the people as it was burned with fire. It suffered outside the camp because it had to. Because it had to take the people's sin away from them. And God accepted this bull as the sin bearer. God accepted this suffering of the animal outside the camp as a sufficient substitute for the death of the people. God said that because this was done, the people's sins were forgiven. They were covered. Now, of course, an animal can't really be a substitute for people. But we know there's more to it than that. The animal was accepted as a sufficient substitute because it was connected to Jesus, who actually could and would carry the sins of the people. Jesus took on the role of a diseased animal, of an animal that needed to be sent outside of the camp and destroyed. As we read in verse 12, So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. to fulfill what was being spoken of here and to complete the picture that was first painted in Leviticus, Jesus suffered outside the camp. Like the bull that carried the sins outside of the camp of the people of Israel, Jesus took the sins of the world upon himself and he went outside the city gates of Jerusalem and there he was destroyed. They led him away to crucify him. As they went out, they found a man of Cyrene, Simon by name. They compelled this man to carry his cross. And when they came to a place called Golgotha, Jesus was cast outside the city. And it had to be outside of the city. The people who were leading him there did not realize that what they were doing was actually completing a picture that had been first painted in Leviticus. Although maybe someone who was watching on and who had been waiting for the Messiah, would realize this. And they would see that this is the one who once and for all will carry our sins away from us. And therefore he must be carried outside the camp, suffer and die, treated like an unclean animal. And Jesus did endure great suffering when he was at the place of the skull. He watched as his garments were torn to pieces as the soldiers were playing a game with them. Those who passed by derided him, wagging their heads and saying, You who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself. If you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. How would that feel, you think? When Jesus heard that kind of ridicule, he knew that he could send himself down from the cross. After all, he was the Son of God just like we might feel if someone is trying to dare us to prove something that they don't think we can. I'm sure Jesus was tempted to prove it as well. But that would have ruined the sacrifice that he was making. No, he had to endure it. He had to take everything that the people were throwing at him. He had to endure the mockery. He saved others, he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down from the cross and we'll believe in him. Did you catch the irony there? What they're saying is actually true. 
They say he saves others, he can't save himself. Of course, they're only talking about physical terms. But Jesus was there to save others. That was his whole purpose for being on that cross. As verse 12 says, he did it in order to sanctify the people through his blood. See, he had to go through all of this in order to make us holy. So that he could save us, he couldn't save himself. He had to endure the mockery and abuse. And so Jesus allowed himself to be treated like an unclean animal, taken outside the city gates, quarantined from the people, abused, and killed. And with him, he took the sin of the entire world. That means your sin and my sin too. Every single rebellion against God that we have taken away from us, given to Jesus as his responsibility to pay for. And we heaped plenty of it upon our Savior's shoulders. Just think about this whole idea of endurance. How often does something come our way that we're not quite in favor of and our immediate reaction is to grumble or complain about it? Right now I have a cold, and you might be able to relate to this, but when you just get the, the sniffles and the sore throat and the runny nose and the uncontrollable sneezing, your first reaction is anger and disgust. It's hard to endure even a tiny minor illness without sinful thoughts creeping in. And what about when the Lord sends actual discipline our ways? How do we react then? When truly difficult things come towards us, we want to dump that cross right off and run away. We don't want anything to do with that. Rather, we question the Lord. We say, why are you sending this to us? Lord, do you love us? Take it away. A little bit of mockery, a ridicule directed towards us a bit of illness that strikes when we don't expect it, or when our bank account balance is too low too quickly. What's our immediate reaction? This is no good, God. Why don't you take care of me? No, we're not much for endurance, especially when it's things we don't like. But Jesus does endure, and not just the physical pain either. Jesus endured the pain of hell, separation from his father when he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus endured the worst of all pain, torment, and suffering. And not just so we could have an example of endurance. Not just so we could look at him and say, that's how I ought to act. No. No. Jesus endured all this so that he could actually be our endurance. That is, whenever you have failed to endure something that God sends your way, whenever you have failed to bear something that you ought to have been able to bear, Jesus endured it in your place. All those trials that come our way and we inevitably fall to, Jesus defeated them. He endured the mockery and ridicule without complaining. He endured the cross and grave. He endured the deepest torments in hell. And it's as if you were standing there heroically taking it all. Yes, Jesus is our endurance. Now, you remember Typhoid Mary? She was quarantined. She was sent away to suffer alone and suffer she did for 30 long years before she died. And all because she carried a deadly disease. But this was the only way to keep people from sickness and from dying. So Jesus carried the deadly disease of the world's sin. He carried it outside of the city gates, quarantining himself to take it away from us and allowed himself to suffer and die and be killed. Put yourself in the shoes of an Old Testament believer and you see your sins 
being put on the animal. You see the animal be killed, and you see its carcass led away. And there you don't see it anymore. But then soon enough, you see that finger of smoke creeping up towards heaven, and you know your sins have been burned up. You are clean. So the Lord invites us to look beyond the walls of Jerusalem and see the cross and see that as the sufficient proof that our sins have been paid for, that they've been taken away by our Savior Jesus, that we are clean. Because Jesus endured all this hostility from sinners, God promises you that you will endure to the end through Jesus Christ, his Son. So this Lenten season, keep your eyes on Jesus. He is our endurance. Amen. Please rise. And the peace of God, which surpasses all our human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. seated for the offering. Join praying together Luther's evening prayer. In the name of God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have graciously kept me today, and I pray that you would forgive me all my sins wherever I have done wrong, and graciously protect me tonight. Into your hands I entrust my body and soul and everything else. Let your holy angel be with me, that the devil may have no power over me. Amen. Receive with believing hearts the blessing of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace.
We conclude with our final hymn, hymn 151, verses 1 and 5 through 7. 151, 1, 5, 6, and 7. Mm -hmm. 